So hi everyone, good afternoon. Yeah, that's a taper. But what I really want to talk about today is about this. The watermelons, watermelon tapers as we like to call them. This is how tapers are born. They have the stripes and spots. And uh, unfortunately, they lose that pattern when they're six or seven month old. They should stay like that forever, I think. But my point is, uh, this is the cutest animal on the face of Earth. <laughs> no cotton tops. No zebras, no African wild dogs or Ethiopian wolf. Tapers are the cutest. No competition, I'm not open for discussion. And, but all jokes aside, I wanna, I wanna tell you a little bit about what we do in Brazil. Um, I run a project called Lowland Taper Conservation Initiative. It's part of the work of, of this institution called IPE, Instituto de Pesquisas Ecológicas, Institute for Ecological Research. Uh, again, we're based in Brazil, in South America, huge country, uh, too many places to go, too many places to see and um, taper populations in different places. Um, this is part of our staff, part of the IPE staff. We're, um, today we're a group of about 100 professionals um, doing conserva conservation work on several different species, several different conservation issues uh, in different parts of Brazil. And our mission is, it's a very long, boring one, but it's, it's, it's basically to conserve biodiversity in Brazil through science, education, and, and training. And, but you must be wondering why, why is she working on tapers? Why tapers? Why are, why are tapers so, so important? Um, and I'm, I'm gonna give you a few reasons why I wanna, wanna share with you. When we started in 1996, 15 years ago, it, there was, it, we knew absolutely nothing about lowland tapers. There was zero knowledge about this animal. So there was, we couldn't even begin to think about how to conserve them. What, what, what do we have to do to conserve an animal if we do not know the basics of this animal, basic ecology, a little bit of, the, little bit of natural history? We didn't know anything. So we, we had to start from scratch and that's a good reason um, to, to, do, to work with an animal. Um, tapers are they're considered to be um, umbrella species. They have, uh, they're very wide ranging. They're all throughout South America, 11 different countries, and they, use, they have very large areas of use and they cover uh, multiple different types of habitat. And therefore, if we, if we do manage to protect tapers, that means we'll be protecting um, uh, um, several other species and um, several different kinds of, uh, of habitats. Um, and we'll be protecting the Atlantic forest, the Pantanal, the, the Amazon, the Cerrado, and we'll be protecting um, other endangered species, like threatened species like jaguars, deer, the very endangered black lion tamarins, um, several um, threatened species of birds, and, uh, and many other animals. Tapers are also considered to be landscape species, and, um, and this means that the, it's, it's a species that once again uses very large um, areas, they have very large home ranges. They require a certain diversity of habitat types to be able to survive, and at the same time they have a very strong impact on the, on the habitats where, where they live, where they're, they're found. Um, so again, conserving tapers um, allows us um, to conserve several different, um, all the different types of habitat where they, where they live. But most importantly, tapers are, are considered to be the gardeners of the forest, or in some cases they're called ecological engineers. Uh, they disperse seeds very effectively. They, they eat mostly fruit. Um, 70, 60, 70% 70 of their diet is composed by fruit, and they eat the fruit, they swallow the seeds, and then they walk away from that particular place, and then they eventually defecate. And the, the seeds that went through the digestive um, system, they receive a certain treatment in the stomach, and when they, are finally, when they finally come out in the feces, they're um, better prepared, better equipped to germinate. Um, so tapers, they, they play with the different 
plant species and they, they make sure they're distributed to different parts of their habitat. So that's why they're, they're known to be the gardeners of the forest and that contributes uh, immensely to, to diversity and to the structure of the, of the habitats where, where they're found. And also, um, tapers, um, they occur um, naturally in very low population numbers, very low population um, density, and they have extremely long reproductive cycles. So we're, we're talking about a 13, 14 month um, gestation period um, for the females, and then they give birth to a single baby, to a single taper calf that may or may not survive because there's predators out there. And then that female, it takes a while for her to get into heat again uh, and get pregnant again. So we're really um, talking about a two-year reproductive cycle. So what does it mean? Uh, it means that a taper population, very low population number, right? They reproduce very slowly. So if you have any sort of impact, if we have hunting, roadkill, whatever, um, impacting that population, and if there's a population decline, that population will take a very long time to recover, if it recovers. So that's, that's, uh, that's, that's key when we think about um, main conservation issues for tapers and why we should, uh, we should protect them. Um, and I'm talking about threats. There's plenty of them affecting tapers in Brazil. The usual suspects, deforestation, fragmentation, hunting and sustainable hunting, especially in the Amazon and in, in the Atlantic forest. Uh, infectious diseases, tapers, they, they live, they share space with domestic livestock and so they, they contract infectious diseases from the livestock. And roadkill is a huge problem in Brazil. You won't drive anywhere in Brazil in a big highway without seeing a taper roadkill. This is, this, is, this is huge, 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 something we, we have been working really hard to, to try and, um, and solve. Um, and, uh, and this is another big problem in Brazil. Um, not many people know what tapers are. Most people think tapers are anteaters and eat ants. So whenever I, I go around, I talk to people and people ask me, so what do you do? Oh, I work with tapers. So, oh, um, you know, how many ants can they eat in, in a day? So this is a big, big problem that we have to deal with in, in my country. And not many people know that tapers are actually related to horses and rhinos, which is, you know, pretty obvious. We should know about that. <laughs> and to make it worse, I mean, much worse, in Brazil, if you want to call a person is stupid, you know, you're so stupid. You call that person, you're such a taper. <laughs> it's like the equivalent of, uh, sorry for the bad language, for jackass here in the US, in, in English. So this is a serious PR problem. So again, I tell people I work on tapers and they ask me the, you know, anteater ant question. I, I educate them and then they, but usually before they ask the question, they laugh. So ha ah, ha you work on tapers because, you know, we have this here, this, you know, connotation of uh, lack of intelligence that we have, uh, we have to deal with. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so with all that in mind and all these many different reasons why we should um, um, get more information about tapers and conserve tapers in Brazil, um, we, we started our conservation work in 1996. I was much younger by then. It was uh, 15 years ago and we started in the Atlantic Forest um, in this little park called Morro do Diabo State Park in Sao Paulo State. And the Atlantic Forest is the most endangered um, uh, ecosystem in Brazil, one of the most endangered ecosystems in the world. There's only 7% of the Atlantic forest left along the coast of Brazil. And uh, this is one part of Brazil that is it's very close to my heart because I grew up in the middle of the Atlantic forest in this little ranch on the way to the coast. So this, this is one place that I, I always go back to. And I actually saw parts of this forest disappearing little by little as I grew up. And um, so that's where we started, pretty much from scratch. We didn't know how to catch tapers. We didn't know how to go about researching them. So we had to figure it all out. 
And uh, for 12 years, we collected every single piece of information that we needed to be able to make recommendations for the conservation of tapirs in the Atlantic forest, in that particular biome of Brazil, which may or may not be relevant for the conservation of tapirs in different biomes in Brazil, because they're so different, different kinds of habitat, different um, threats that tapirs face in different places. Um, and tapers are very plastic, they, they sort of adapt well to different conditions, so we really had to, you know, um, pack our bags, get on the road, and expand our reach, expand our work. Um, so in 2008, we, we started all over again in the Pantanal with a little bit more experience, so we were not as lost as we were in, in the Atlantic Forest in the beginning in 1996. Um, the Pantanal is located in the very center of South America, in the border between Brazil, Paraguay, and Bolivia. And it's, 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 it's the largest continuous freshwater wetland on the planet. It gets flooded for five or six months a year. And this particular picture, the big one, was taken last March. We had the most intense flood in the last 25 years. It was, it was very, very dramatic. And... Um, we're already looking into expanding our work into the Amazon and the Cerrado biome. So this is the dream. This is what we want to see in the near future. And let's say in the next five years, we want to see taper research and conservation programs operating in each one of the four main biomes where they're still found in Brazil. And we want to be able to collect information about tapers in each one of these biomes and develop strategies for their conservation in each one of these biomes according to the realities that we're going to find in each one of the biomes and the different threats that we'll be dealing with. Um, but overall, um, the work of the Lowland Taper Conservation Initiative has seven main components, and I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about <clears throat> each one of them. First, uh, research is still a big part of what we do. We're still, we, we've been working on tapers for, 12, for, for a long time now, uh, but we're still learning um, new pieces of information every single day, and there's, there's still a lot to, a lot to understand. Uh, in terms of taper behavior, social organization, reproduction, lots of very precious pieces of information that we still need to be able to, to conserve them more, more effectively. So questions like how much space do they need? Um, maybe it's different from uh, in the Pantanal, maybe it's different from what we found in the Atlantic Forest and it will be different from what we will find one day in the Cerrado, in the Amazon. How much space do they need? And that brings us to, to, to the question, so what, what should be the size of a protected area? Uh, how, how big should it be to protect a good, healthy, viable population of tapers? These are, are the kind of future uh, measures that we're going to have to deal with. Um, Social organization, as I, as I said, this is still a bit of a mystery. Tapers are nocturnal, solitary, really hard to study, actually. It's really, it's, it's very difficult to get um, uh, accurate information about them. So we're now using camera traps to try and, uh, and collect um, the pieces of information that we were not able to collect in the Atlantic forest. In the Pantanal, tapers are, are more used to to human beings. Um, the Pantanal, it's, it's a big mixture of cattle ranching and, uh, and natural areas. So they're used to seeing the cowboys uh, running around the place all the time. So they're, it's easier for us to see them uh, on a more regular basis. Um, so now we're actually, um, we, we can identify our, our tapers. This is Benjamin. We've been radio tracking him for three years now. This is, uh, um, uh, he's a male course, and this is his girlfriend, Rita. So we've been taking, uh, we've been um, getting pictures of these two hanging out together quite often, and uh, they had a baby last year, Tonico, this is um, the baby. So we're now seeing this kinds of things, uh, how much time do the female and the male stay together while they mate, um, how long um, do the juveniles stay with the females before they leave home and go, you know, find their own space in the world. So, and this is gonna help us to model taper populations in the future, and uh, we'll be able to, to analyze the viability of the populations based on, on, on information like this. 
So what do they eat? We collect lots of taper poo. Um, I have a refrigerator at home and I have about 350 samples right now. If there is anyone out there who would like to process those samples for me, I would appreciate the help. Um, but we want to know what they eat and how, how, how effectively do they, do they actually disperse seeds and what species of plants do they disperse. Uh, what, what plants should we, should we use in the future for restoration programs for habitat? Um, These kinds of questions, again, thinking into the future and into the measures that we're going to have to take to protect them. Um, health. Are the populations healthy? We have been finding lots of infectious diseases on tapers, on the, on the animals that we capture and sample. Um, so far we have found five um, different types of infectious diseases, and we're now trying to understand how exactly uh, they affect the tapers. Do they really get sick or do they just get exposed? Does the, do, they, do the diseases affect the reproduction, mortality of, of babies? Those kinds of questions. Uh, so we have a team of veterinarians um, working on that. So this is just a general overview of what we do in terms of research. There is, there is quite a bit more. And then we use all that information, as I said, to, to make plans. So okay, we know um, this, this and that, and, uh, and uh, now uh, we need to make plans. We need to, to, to develop strategies to conserve these animals. As I said, specific strategies for each one of the biomes where we're working. Um, we also, but on the other hand, we also want to think on the national level. This is a, this is a nationwide conservation initiative. So we're feeding all the information that we have been collecting into a national process of action planning. Brazil is going through a process of uh, developing action plans for all the threatened species in the country. This is a governmental initiative and uh, our data has been extremely helpful when it, when it comes to tapers in the country. But we also want to spread information as much as possible and contribute information as much as possible to other researchers, other conservation organizations trying to conserve tapers throughout the distribution range in South America and, and many other um, countries. Um, but before, action planning is a little bit more long term. There are certain things that we have to deal with right now. We have to be able to apply our data um, right now. Um, so um, I said that roadkill is a big problem for tapers in Brazil, and it is. It's becoming worse, so this is something that we had to deal with more quickly. Um, this is a highway that crosses Morro do Diabo State Park, the site where we worked in the Atlantic Forest. And um, during the project at Morro do Diabo, uh, we monitored roadkill in this highway, and an average of six tapers would get hit by cars and killed every year, and many other animals, jaguars, pumas, ocelots, uh, foxes, you name it. But six, jug six tapers. And if you think, again, long reproductive cycle, right? Uh, if we think that, that three or four of those animals were females in reproductive age, it's a huge impact on the population. So we modeled that level of roadkill for that particular population. We think we have about 130 tapers in Morro do Diabo. That's our estimate based on the, on the research that we've done. And um, when we modeled the population and, and the impact of that level of roadkill, it told us, the model told us that if that continued, tapers would go extinct in Morro do Diabo in about 40 years. So we wrote a report. We sent that report to the managers of the park in the first place, to, um, in the regional level, in the, in the state level. We called the media. We, the news uh, papers came. And the main result was, was, of that was that they uh, very quickly got really scared with, with what they were seeing, and, uh, and they installed speed radars all throughout the highway. We have now this huge signpost telling people to slow down and um, informing them about the animals that we have in Morro do Diabo. We have a nice portal in the entrance of the park, so people actually know that they're entering a protected area. And uh, the main result was that was that right now, we have one taper killed every three years. So we went from, thanks. So yeah, so we went from 
six per year to one every three years, and that's and we model the population again. If if that continues like that, tapers are okay. They're going to be there for the next 100 years. So this is something we're we're very happy. We're very proud of. But then uh, we also, when we worked in the Atlantic Forest, we also found out that the tapers they lived in Morro do Diabo. They lived inside the park, but eventually they would uh, leave the park and cross the landscape in between the park and the surrounding forest fragments um, around the park, and they would go to these fragments, they would spend some time over there looking for other researchers that, uh, resources that they couldn't find in the park. They would eventually come back. So what we saw was a lot of movement throughout the landscape in the, around Morro do Diabo, and, uh, and then we thought, okay, well, um, these animals are actually showing us potential places where we could establish corridors we could use these pathways that they're, they're using to establish real, actual corridors so that tapers could cross, tapers, uh, other animals could move through the landscape. So we've, we have been using tapers as landscape detectives, as we like to call them. So they tell us where to go, and then we go there, we establish corridors. Um, and uh, if, if you look, um, if you uh, look at um, satellite images of how it was before and how it is today, we can already see the corridors forming in between the forest fragments around Morro do Diabo State Park, and that's thanks to research data that, uh, that we have been collecting. Um, environmental education, it's something that we also, we also have to do um, around the areas where we work, and then we have to think uh, of the different types of public that we're dealing with, uh, in the Atlantic Forest, it was mostly urban schools in the little towns around the park. Uh, in the Pantanal, we're mostly talking about rural schools in the middle of the floodplains, mostly kids, uh, but also cowboys, also the landowners. 95% of the Pantanal is privately owned. Uh, most people think that the Pantanal is this big um, protected area, natural area, but no, we have three protected areas in the Pantanal. It's about 5% of the, of the area. So there, uh, in the Pantanal floodplain, the, the, the reality is that we have to work with um, private landowners. Um, IPE and the Lowland Taper Conservation in Initiative, we put a lot of effort into um, uh, training the conservationists of the future. So we have a training center in Sao Paulo, and we offer about 50 different courses, um, conservation-related courses every year, and to students from all over Latin America that come and receive training in many, many different topics. And um, we're also, we also offer, um, we try and provide um, capacity building to the local communities around the areas where we work. And this is usually by demand, um, like this um, uh, group, of, uh, group of community members around the ranch where we work in the Pantanal, they came to us and they said, well, we would love um, to be able to, 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 you know, to do reforestation in certain, par certain parts of the ranches where we work, in certain parts of the ranches where, that we own, um, but we just don't know how to go about that. And we have a whole course on how to plant seedlings, how to build a, a plant nursery, and how to go about uh, doing reforestation. So we brought the course and they got the training that they requested from us. So it's usually by demand. Whatever they think they need, we, we put together a course and we bring it. And then scientific tourism. Um, we're trying to reach all the different kinds of public. And scientific tourism, it's, it's just giving the general public a chance to be a researcher for a certain amount of time, um, giving the person a chance to have a hands-on experience uh, with a research team. Um, so we have been receiving lots of volunteers, and this is mostly international. People from all over the world have been joining us for our expeditions, and they're taper researchers for, for two weeks. And uh, they don't come to watch, they come to work. They, have, uh, they, they work side by side with us, and we also receive um, eco-tours. We work with um, tour operators throughout the world. And uh, we bring groups of visitors that come, spend time with us in the field. They learn about tapers. They learn about the Pantanal. They fall in love with the Pantanal. They fall in love with tapers. They fall in love with us. And uh, so we're trying to build this little taper army 
uh, people that will go back home and they will tell their family, they, they will talk to their kids about tapers, they will talk to their colleagues about tapers, and more and more people will hear about this uh, wonderful animal. So everybody's invited to come and participate. The Pantanal is a wonderful place. If you would like to organize a group, a tour, talk to me after the presentation. I would love, love to introduce you to the Pantanal and tapers. And outreach. Um, as I said, not many people in Brazil know what tapers are. Uh, they think they're stupid. Um, so we have a lot of PR work to do on behalf of tapers. So before anything else, we're constantly talking about them. Talk, talk, talk. Tapers, tapers, tapers all the time. Presentations in schools, presentations in universities, community centers, conferences, um, e ecotourism facilities, whatever. If someone calls me, can you come and talk about tapers? I will be there in a minute. We have to spread the word. So we do that all the time, all the members of the team. Web presence. Uh, we have a very nice website now, entirely dedicated to tapers, and a very nice blog. We're in the social media world. I never thought I would do this. I never thought uh, that I would have the time to do Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, but it's, I, I learned how powerful these tools are, and uh, we have been reaching thousands of people through the internet. And um, so now I'm, 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 I'm putting a lot more faith in, um, in social media. And the media itself. Uh, we have been working really, really hard in Brazil and also outside of Brazil, but mostly in Brazil, to put tapers on the media. Uh, we're very fortunate in Brazil we have this the, the most well-respected uh, environmental journalist in the country, her name is Liana John, and she's crazy about tapers. And, uh, and I absolutely love her for that, because she helps me get space on the media all the time. So over the last um, year and a half, she has, been, she has helped us to get um, taper articles on, on, on all the most uh, on the, uh, all the, the largest uh, nature magazines in Brazil, Terra da Gente, Horizonte Geográfico, uh, Brasileiros. So we had several taper profiles. Talking about tapers in general, the work we do, and uh, what the general public can do to, to save them. And we have to be creative as well. Uh, nobody, not, not many people know, but tapers are very good painters. They're, very, they're artists. And um, so... Two years ago, I heard about the, the animal artists um, in, in, in here in zoos in the U.S. Uh, so you have orangutans, you have elephants painting, making paintings, and, uh, and the American zoos are organizing auctions and these big art exhibits for, for, all, you know, for all these animals and raising funds and raising awareness for the conservation of these animals. So, you know, you look at, look at the taper, they have the little, you know, proboscis. And I saw a lot of potential there. And so I talked to people from the Houston Zoo, the person who is actually who, who organizes the orangutan events. And I said, do you think we could do something like that for tapers? And she said, sure. And uh, so we, we got six zoos here in the US involved. Uh, they got their tapers to paint. We collected 30 paintings. We brought them back to Brazil. And I, I really, I, of course, I wanted to have the event in Brazil, the, the whole thing, because that, that was the main objective. So we brought the paintings back to Brazil. And last June, on the 15th of June, we had this uh, big art exhibit in Sao Paulo City, which is, and I chose Sao Paulo because it's the main cultural center for the country. All the movers and shakers are there, the media, intellectuals, artists, everybody's in Sao Paulo. And so we held the event at the Sao Paulo Zoo. And uh, so we, we auctioned the taper paintings and uh, wonderful uh, photographs by wildlife photographers from Brazil, taper pictures and pictures of taper habitat. And it was, it was huge, it was huge. We had 150 people, not a large crowd, but the media went insane. They could not believe that tapers could paint. They could, they just, they, they couldn't come around the idea that animals could paint, let alone tapers, the stupid animals that, you know, they think it ends. 
And so we would get phone calls because we distributed a press release talking about the event. We wanted to call attention to the cause and we used the event just for that. So people from the media would call me, so are you serious? Can I actually publish this? Because is this a lie? Is this a joke? No, this is serious. So we had about 70 appearances on the media. Um, a lot of it was online, but we also had printed articles and we had seven TV uh, appearances, um, five of them on national television and big pieces like five minutes, six minutes. And uh, we estimated how much we actually raised in terms of media exposure. And it was over three million reais, which is the Brazilian currency, which should be about uh, almost two million dollars. Just in media exposure for for tapers, yeah. And that actually uh, ended up in this um, super famous talk show in Brazil. It's like the, um, who, who's the famous? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's the equivalent. This is Jos Soares. It's very hard to get on this show. I, I, was, I had been trying for years. It was the tapers helping tapers event that put me there. And uh, it's national TV, every single Brazilian watches the show, so every single Brazilian will hear about tapers. It's gonna be broadcasted on Monday night now. Um, so this, this was huge, and uh, no other conservationist in Brazil ever had the chance to go there and talk about their animals, so this was, this was a really big deal. He's horrible, but it was, <laughs> it was good. And he, he's a comedian, so I was, I was scared to death that he would only explore the whole tapers stupid um, side of the story. But, um, but he, he, he completely surprised me. He was very serious. He was very much interested about tapers. Not so much the project, actually. He wanted to know about the animals. So uh, he, he asked really interesting questions. And in the end of the, of the show, when he says goodbye, you know, good night, everyone, he looked at the camera and he said, Brazilians, you heard the lady. It's time to save tapers. So it was, it was really, really nice. So yeah, we, we've come a long way. There's little things we do, very local, like doing a little research in the Atlantic Forest, in the Pantanal. There's things we do more on the national level, like the awareness, the, the training. The, and the, but as I said, this is the dream. In the near future, we wanna, we wanna see taper program programs operating in the in different parts of brazil we want to be um, uh, developing really good uh, realistic strategies for the conservation of tapers in all those places and uh, so the next step is the cerrado and then the amazon will be there soon um, we need help um, we need help to make that happen so if there's anybody out there willing to help i'm ready to accept your help um, and this is the final message I would like to leave with you. you know, lots of people talk about tigers, they're very sexy, it's a very sexy species, gorillas is a very sexy species, you know, tapers, eh, not so much. They're very sexy, okay? <laughs> so go home and, you know, bring the message to everyone you know. Thank you. Thank you.